Welcome to Image Maker Media. I'm Joyce Knudsen. Today we are honored to have Michael E. Gerber. He discovered that businesses were owned primarily by people with technical skills, but few had business skills. Over the years, his companies have helped small business owners successfully transform their businesses into world-class operations. What an accomplishment. Welcome to the show, Michael. Well, thank you, Dr. Joyce. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Well, in your blog, the Gerber Particles, is that the name of your blog? <laughs> well, it's part of the name of my blog. Okay, well, that's um, what I had seen on your website. <laughs> what is the name of your blog? Just Michael Gerber's blogs. Oh, okay, well, that's easy. Okay, well, in those blogs, you speak about four dimensions entrepreneurs have. You also said that all four are necessary and intertwined. Can you tell us about these dimensions and why they are so important? Absolutely. Well, I, I, I call them the dreamer, the thinker, the storyteller, and the leader. The dreamer has a dream. The thinker has a vision. The storyteller has a purpose. And the leader has a mission. And as you go deeper into that, you begin to understand that, in fact, not only are those four dimensions of a entrepreneurial personality, but they are also four steps in a process for creating the foundation for a company. So it's a very, very exciting process to engage in, and we engage uh, participants in what we call a dreaming room so that, in fact, you can discover what your dream is, you can discover how that leads into a vision, you can discover why it's absolutely essential to have a purpose, and you can discover the purpose of a mission. I love that. I'm actually a dreamer, very much so. I've always had a vision. I've always felt my purpose and mission, and I love the way you described them. I've never heard them described in those four terms before, so this is very good information for my listeners. You have written many books, Michael. I read your first book written in 1986, a year after I opened my business, The E-Myth. After this book, you wrote The E-Myth Revisited. What are some of the changes you felt necessary to write in the second book? Well, actually, the e Revisited goes deeper into the first book. Uh, the first book essentially um, describes why most small businesses don't work and what to do about it. And in fact, if you really look at it, it's why all businesses fail to work and what to do about it, whether those are small, medium, or large. The e Revisited again, revisited the e-myth by engaging in a conversation with a reader. And the reader is Sarah, um, the um, baker of pies. And essentially, Sarah is every client, every small business owner I've ever spoken to. And we have spoken literally to hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of them over the past 40 years. And so you can begin to see if you've read the first book, The E-Myth, and then go on to read the second book, The E-Myth Revisited, that essentially I'm really taking each of the chapters and having a conversation with Sarah as she's reading those chapters and applying them to her business and to the way she thinks about her business to change the paradigm by which a technician suffering from an entrepreneurial seizure truly awakens the, the, the true entrepreneur within her. What a wonderful idea. I have not read that book, but I'm going to go get it after this call. Uh, you got to do it. I do, absolutely. Well, actually, I've been in business 30 years, so there's uh, I know a lot of this stuff, but I love learning from you, Michael. In your books, you write about people working at their businesses but not in their businesses. Tell our listeners what you mean by this. Well, what I mean is working on your business as opposed to working in your business essentially is the driving force of entrepreneurial mindset. And effectively, by working on it, I mean that in order to transform your business, you have to be able to transcend your business, that is, see it from above. So it's like the forest for the trees. Uh, everybody knows that um, little cliche that bumping into trees, bumping into trees, bumping into trees, but you never really see the forest. Well, the reality is very few small business owners or all business owners actually see the forest 
forest of their business. They're constantly bumping into trees, bumping into problems, trying to solve those problems on the ground as opposed to from up above. And so the plan view of a business is absolutely critical to awaking the entrepreneur within, because that's how entrepreneurs, true entrepreneurs, the true entrepreneurial personality, the dreamer, the thinker, the storyteller, and the leader, actually see and comprehend what's missing in this picture and what the opportunity is. They have a vision. What a great analogy that you've come up with. How did you come up with this revelation to help small business owners? And where did you get the confidence that you needed all those years ago that you can turn small businesses into something much bigger? Well, it's a, it's a great question, and the answer is um, very, very simply, I just saw it. And essentially, I just saw it because um, a very close friend of mine asked me to come and um, talk to one of his clients. My friend had a small advertising agency in Silicon Valley, and he primarily focused on small um, startup tech companies and providing them with advertising services. And he essentially told me that this particular client was having it finding it difficult to convert the leads that the advertising was creating into sales. So he asked me if I would come speak to this client. And, of course, I told my friend I didn't know anything about business, and I believed, honest to God, I didn't. And, two, um, that it was obvious to me that the guy owns a business who must know about business. But, in any case, um, I didn't convince my friend, so um, <laughs> he brought me there. And uh, introduced me to Bob, and my friend then said, look, guys, I'm going to take off for about an hour, um, get to know each other. And he left. So Bob's looking at me, I'm looking at Bob, and Bob says to me, well, Michael, what do you know about my business? Well, nothing, Bob. He says, well, if you don't know anything about my business, what do you know about my products? And I say, less than that, Bob. <laughs> So obviously, I'm standing there with Bob with an hour to kill. What do I do? Well, I start the conversation by asking some questions. The first thing that you absolutely need to do is to begin to ask questions. Absolutely. As you begin to ask questions, I begin to discover that I have two assumptions. One, I don't know anything about business. And two, Bob does. And as I'm asking Bob the questions, I'm beginning to discover that, in fact, I do know something about business. I know that selling is a system, and I knew that because I learned how to sell encyclopedias by a guy, a true master of the sale, who taught me a system in order to become successful at that. I didn't have to know anything about the product. I didn't have to know anything about selling. All I needed to do was to learn how to use his system, and I did. And, of course, I also discovered that's exactly the way I learned how to play the saxophone. This is how you do it. This is how you do it. This is how you do it. My saxophone teacher told me, you don't make music, Michael. You find music. Your job is to practice. Your job is to practice what I tell you to practice, how I tell you to practice, how long I tell you to practice, and then come up here and allow me to beat you up about the head and shoulders. And that's what essentially I learned. So here I'm sitting with this guy in this, in quotes, high-tech firm who's not converting leads into sales, and I suddenly discover, well, it's so obvious why he isn't doing that, because he doesn't have a selling system. So he asked me if I could create a selling system for him. And, of course, I said I could. So when my friend comes back to pick me up, he says, so what happened? I said he gave me a job. <laughs> That's a wonderful story. Well, it really, it's so easy, isn't it? It's really so simple, and people don't get it. Well, it is so simple, and it's so obvious the minute you begin to look at it. But you have to look at it with a blank piece of paper and beginner's mind. Yeah. You can't go in with all the answers. You've got to go in with an open mind if you're ever going to see anything clearly. 
And that's what we teach in the dreaming room, a blank piece of paper and beginner's mind. You don't go in with an outcome in mind. You go in with the interest to discover what's missing in this picture. And absolutely every single time, I don't care what the experience of the guy, the lady, every single time, that's what happens in the dreaming room. They begin to discover something they were not aware of before they walked in. Well, speaking of the discovery process, we have talked about the dreaming room, and I think many people, especially entrepreneurs, like to dream. As I understand it, this is a a two-and-a-half-day program held throughout the United States, Canada, and the U.K., I know a lot of people. I've got 600,000 on Twitter. This sounds very exciting. How did you come up with this idea? And tell our listeners how they can get involved. Well, interestingly, the the two-and-a-half-day dreaming room that you're speaking about is exactly how I started it. Um, I absolutely, over the years, came to the realization that while I could fix broken businesses, and that's what we were doing at EMIT, fixing broken businesses, fixing tens of thousands of broken businesses around the world, I came to the realization that even while we were doing that, the people who owned those businesses weren't truly becoming entrepreneurial. They were simply fixing the machine that didn't work, all for the purpose of comfort, meaning I want to make more money, I want to live a better life and all that, and all that was fine, but that had nothing to do with entrepreneurship. Steve Jobs didn't start Apple to become comfortable. Steve Jobs started Apple because he was completely consumed with a picture he had in his mind and his heart. He was so passionate about that. So how to create that passion? So I decided to do a dreaming room. And one day while I was speaking, I invited um, people who were in the room. There were about 600 people in the room uh, to come dream with me in the dreaming room. And I offered a have them come there for two and a half days, and they would ask me, well, what are we going to do? And I said, I haven't a clue, but we'll find out. And I absolutely know that's what we will do. We will find out. Yes. And so two and a half days at a time, 59 dreaming rooms later, I'd built a dreaming room system so I could replicate myself so I'm not leading a dreaming room Anybody else who, in fact, has been through the certification process will lead a dreaming room. But now the dreaming room is 12 weeks, not two and a half days. One three-hour intensive a week on Zoom, wherever they are, for 12 consecutive weeks. And during that time, they discover their dream, their vision, their purpose, and their mission. And I like to say, the dreaming room is what you do before you write a business plan. It's the foundation. Without a dream, without a vision, without a purpose, without a mission, and in fact, that's what's missing, Joyce, in every business I've ever walked into. Without those absolutely fundamental, clear, driving forces at the, uh, the, the, the the baseline of a business, a business isn't going to go anywhere. Yes, you might become more comfortable. Yes, you might create more cash flow. Yes, you might create more personal income. But I promise you, you'll never create a truly meaningful result. That's what the dreaming was intended to do, become that platform for every single small business venture in the world. Well, I certainly want to get that message out for you because I've noticed the same thing. In only 12 weeks, it's remarkable. I love 12 message. weeks. 12, 12 weeks. That's amazing that they can go from not knowing anything about this to being ready to fly. I think that's great. Uh, I love your message on your website about passion being the key to admission, and action is what is needed to become a leader. Most people don't take action. Please clarify this message, Michael. Well, it's absolutely clear. I, I call it the jobs effect. You know, everybody in the government talks about jobs, 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 jobs. Yeah. It becomes a political banner. Well, the reality is without jobs, there aren't any jobs, and so that's a play on words. The Steve Jobs inside of every single human being on earth. I believe we're born in the image of God. And I believe if we're born in the image of God, we're born to create. 
And I believe that if that is not the driving force behind the creation of a company, that company will never achieve the clarity and the passion that a company like Apple was able to create. When you understand that Apple was started by two guys who didn't know anything about business, Jobs and Wozniak, with only $5,000 between them, and that that company today is the most valued company on earth. And they started right down the street from me just about the very same time. you got to say to yourself, my God, what's missing in this picture? And what's missing in this picture is the passion that Jobs and Wozniak brought to bear on the creation of this extraordinary enterprise. That's the thing. So obviously, without that, it's just work. Well said. I, I couldn't have said it better myself. I don't live down the street from jobs, but I can't go anywhere without my iPad and my iPod. So they certainly are uh, amazing. They did, did amazing things and was it out of their garage. And I don't even think yep. that Steve Jobs had a, did he even have an education. I don't even think he did. No, he didn't. Yeah. Dropped and, out of school. And many people, just like I think Bill Gates only had one year of college, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah, school got in the way of what he was about to do. School gets in the way about everybody's there to do. In it fact, does. if you think it, about it. It does. As a woman, I felt that I needed a Ph.D., especially in the field of image consulting, which a lot of people are think that is fluff. Uh, I wanted to say, no, it's not fluff, and Ph.D. says that. So uh, it's really uh, wonderful, I think, when people know their passion. Do you think, Michael, that some people are born uh, feeling differently about their self-esteem or they're just born to be great Uh, and other people just are sort of existing what do you think about that no i don't believe it i don't believe that that when we're born um anything is true other than um we're as open as anything could possibly be i believe that in fact we're born and then we begin to be shaped and we begin to be shaped by obviously our dna but our dna plays less a part in it as we're beginning to discover than in what would imagine we're beginning to be shaped by the fears and concerns of our parents we're beginning to be shaped by the fears and concerns of our teachers we're beginning to be shaped by the fears and concerns of the institutions that affect us and surround us we begin to be shaped by everything and anything that's going on in the world or not going on in the world all of which is designed to control us so the reality is we're born to create but the problem is the creative energy in a child is very very disruptive to the order of the family and so the parents are constantly trying to limit the creativity of the child to get them to mind their peace and cues to get them to clean their room to get them to do their homework to get them to to get them to and in the process of doing that i believe we're shaped and then because of our addictive nature addictive in the fact that so much of what occurs to us is unconscious as opposed to conscious because of that addictive um, tendency in all of us we become addicted to ways of being that in fact will never serve our growth our creativity our expansion ability and so forth and so on and that's the disaster of it so imagine if we could begin at the very beginning anew and imagine if we could do that to truly begin to discover something we never knew and suddenly to be in an environment in which our creativity is honored loved respected cherished wow wouldn't that be extraordinary so that's the way it is and i'm essentially believing being is Uh, much of a romantic as I am, but a pragmatist as well, I believe that every single one of us can discover the entrepreneur within, can go back to the beginning and truly begin to discover what it means to create. 
So I see the task of going from being a consumer to a creator. We've got a choice. We're going to either be a creator or a consumer. We're either going to live our lives consuming what others create, or we're going to live our lives creating what others consume. Well, I choose the latter rather than the former. That's a brilliant analysis, and it makes so much sense to me. I'm always amazed at how age doesn't play a factor in how long businesses are in business. Obviously, you have passion, but there has to be another secret as to how you motivate yourself year after year, time after time, to continue with your pursuit to help small businesses grow. Well, the, 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 the truth is it comes from within, Joyce. Um, it is a passion. It is an obsession. Um, I'm obsessive compulsive. I'm determined. Um, I can't be pushed off track. Failures are not failures, but interruptions. And effectively, for whatever reason, I'm constantly being called by that muse, which essentially is that poet within, that imagineer, as Walt Disney calls it, within. I mean, there's just no other way to live. I couldn't possibly not do what I do, no matter how difficult it is at times, no matter how impossible it is at times. What do you do? Well, somebody says, so what do you do with the fear? Um, and I said to my wife, and it's sitting there right above me, as so I'm looking at the wall in front of my uh, computer, I say, I create my way through fear. I create my way through fear. Why? Because it has such incredible feeling attached to it. Seeing this extraordinary thing that begins to take form in front of you, experiencing this thing that you truly couldn't see before you actually created it, but you could imagine it, and you suddenly begin to understand the power of imagination has over all of the negative feelings that possess us and consume us um, day after day after day. Wow, that's really powerful, I think, um, and self-esteem has something to do with that, and I think people just um, sometimes are caught up in what they think they can't do and looking at failure as something that's bad, and I feel that failure is a way to getting successful because you find out what doesn't work. Well, how could you, how could you not fail? We're so stupid. <laughs> how could we how could we not fail? That's the truth is true. what we know is so much less than what we don't. How could we possibly know what in fact we're going to be confronted with in step two or step ten or step twenty? We can't possibly know. So it's simply going out and doing it. And as we begin to go out and do it, it begins to talk back to us. It begins to say yes. It begins to say no. It begins to say maybe. It begins to say, did you really think this through? It begins to say, were you really prepared? And then you begin to understand that this whole conversation with your life, with the world around you, with the things that you create and the things that you don't understand, this whole conversation is it's called life. If there is no conversation like that, there is no life. So understand all of these signals that are coming to us are telling us things. You've got to be open to what they're saying. Imagine them as voices. Imagine them as angels. Imagine them as devils. Imagine them as anything you wish. But understand they're speaking to you. They're saying, Michael, listen to me. Watch this. See what happens. And then, and then do what comes next. And it's so absolutely extraordinary. Well, Michael, you are absolutely extraordinary. And uh, definitely you're, you see life so clearly, and many can't. So I, kudos to you for all that you've done. I'd like to give you the last word. What would you like our listeners to take with them after they listen to this interview? I would say every single one of you understand this compelling idea. You're here to go to work on your life, not just in your life. 
here to transcend your life if you're ever going to transform your life. And this is not rhetoric. This is absolute practice. This comes from years of experience working with people who are struggling with every single kind of thing that you're struggling with and finding a way through it and finding a way around it and finding a way over it and suddenly discovering something that you missed completely. So go to work on your life, not in your life, and come join me in the dreaming room. It will blow your mind. Well, I'll say it again. You're, we're here to work in your life. Uh, we're, we're, to work, we're here to work on, our, on your life and not in your life. And I think You got that- it. So wonderful of a message. Please tell our listeners, Michael, how to get in touch with you. All you got to do is come to Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, just like Michael, at MichaelEGerber.com. Michael at MichaelEGerber.com. It's so easy. And then just say, I want to do the Dreaming Room. Heard you on Dr. Joyce. I wanted to do the dreaming room, and we'll get back to you. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Michael Gerber. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Joyce. Take care. You too.